Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Halleck. I'm president of the University of Richmond, and I'm honored to welcome you, welcoming you to unpacking the census. Um, I'm a labor market economist. For the last 30 years or so, I've spent time unpacking the census, and I'm glad that other people are working on it too. Um, this is really an, uh, an awesome partnership among a bunch of uh, wonderful organizations in our community. The Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities, the University of Richmond's Bonner Center for Civic Engagement, UR's School for Professional and Continuing Studies, and UR's Spatial Analysis Lab. Today, we're excited to celebrate a decade, 10 years of collaboration and hard work and dedication of community facilitators, student interns, staff, and faculty. I just want to say a few words about the university, experiential learning and community engagement, and how unpacking the census, this Unpacking the Census partnership is a great example of this sort of work in action. I love being here at the University of Richmond, and I believe one of our great advantages as a university is our location within a dynamic region and our commitment to learning and engaging with a greater community. At UR, we encourage students to intern, to volunteer, and engage in hands-on learning opportunities. Thanks to donor support from what we call the Richmond Guarantee, every single undergraduate is eligible for a fellowship of up to $5,000 for an unpaid or underpaid summer internship or faculty mentored research project. Our 81 community partners enhance the work of our university as they mentor, advise, teach students in nonprofits and government organizations across our region. Civic engagement is a fundamental cornerstone of UR's educational experience, empowering students to become active and informed. 1,274, 1,274 undergraduates completed community-based learning courses just last year. For more than a decade through unpacking the census, people who really care about our region and the quality of life for the people who live here have pulled their expertise, their time, and the tools at their disposal to understand how we arrived at the Richmond we know today and to imagine how we might chart a more inclusive path forward. Thank you to every single one of you who made this partnership possible. Thanks to our speakers and panelists for coming and spending time with us today. And thanks for all of you who are here to celebrate this milestone with us. And now it's my honor, I'm trying to find him, oh there he is, to welcome Jonathan Zur, who's a UR class of 2003 and the president and CEO of the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities to come on up to the stage. Thank you so much. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, President Halleck. Thank you to the University of Richmond for hosting us this evening. Uh, this is a really special partnership, as you heard, between our team at the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities and our wonderful friends at the Bonner Center for Civic Engagement, the School of Professional and Continuing Studies, and the Spatial Analysis Lab here at the University of Richmond. There's one really important person who sadly is not here with us to celebrate this event. As many of you know, the Unpacking the Census program was inspired by and in so many ways advanced by the passion and heart and expertise of Dr. John Mieser. We miss John this evening as he passed away just a few weeks ago. And we are grateful to Sharon Mieser for joining us tonight on her birthday to be part of this uh, special event. Thank you, Sharon, for being with us. We have a small gift for you for your birthday. Unpacking the Census is truly a shared endeavor, and in addition to the three partners who have worked to coordinate tonight's program, we also have many folks who've been involved in this program over the last decade here uh, with us. They include many of the facilitators, the community facilitators, who were part of the program as we engage in community outreach and education, and many of the student interns who have worked with the Center for Civic Engagement and the Spatial Analysis Lab. Would all of the student interns and community facilitators for unpacking the census stand up so we can thank you?
In a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to watch a brief video that was produced by Randall Taylor to learn more about John and the Unpacking the Census program. In it, I hope that you will note how this community-centered program increased awareness and catalyzed community action to address structural inequality in our region. We should all be proud that an initiative, an idea that began more than 10 years ago has now become a decade-long initiative with hopefully more to come. So please turn your attention now to the screen.
As you saw on that last slide, uh, we now have an Unpacking the Census website. If you go to unpackingthecensus.org, you will see the past presentations, the past maps, the video from the Unpacking the Census program 10 years ago. We will be posting the slides that you are going to see tonight, as well as the full video of tonight's program. So please visit unpackingthecensus.org to be able to access the critical information that we have been able to share through this program. And please share your ideas about how that website can be a resource and a tool for our community going forward. Uh, now it is a moment that we've long been looking forward to. Uh, where I have the opportunity to introduce folks who will be sharing for the first time publicly our 2010 census data and helping us make meaning of this last decade. You met them briefly in the video, Dr. Kyle Redigan, who's director of the Spatial Analysis Lab here at the University of Richmond, where he teaches courses on geographic information systems and spatial data science. He recently completed his PhD in geography from Michigan State University and is relatively new to Richmond, and we're so fortunate that he has joined this community. And Sarah Murtaugh, who is a senior here at the University of Richmond, double majoring in geography and global studies. And as you saw, she is this year's John V. Mieser Unpacking the Census Fellow and a, a tremendous student uh, who spent a lot of time preparing for tonight's presentation. So Kyle and Sarah will be presenting for about 15 to 20 minutes the 2020 census data, and that will be followed by a panel discussion where we'll get to together make meaning of this information and think about uh, some of the actions that our community might need. For now, please join me in welcoming Kyle and Sarah. All right, so first and foremost, we want to thank everybody for being out here tonight. Um, it's a, a large crowd, which is kind of nice. Um, a lot of people have a lot of interest in this stuff. Also, this presentation wasn't just me and Sarah working on it. It was mostly Sarah. Um, <laughs> she's, on, she's on the job market here, everybody, so, you know, if you're hiring. But uh, honestly, it's been a lot of, a, a, lot of a combination of Alexandra, Tom, and Jonathan providing a lot of time and input into what they wanted to see coming out of this. So thank, thanks John, um, Alexandra, and Tom for uh, all the support in this, and we'll kind of get to it. All right, so when Kyle and I started working on this presentation together, I'm going to be honest, we were a little worried. We saw some of the past year's presentations for unpacking the census, and they had around 100 slides. <laughs> um, but we are happy to announce for your sake and for our sake that we will only be up here for about 20 minutes. So we want to first start off by getting to know the two sur surveys where we got our data from. First, we have the census. The census started off in 1790 to count every person living in the United States to determine congressional representation. Today, it still serves the same purpose. The 2020 census only asked 10 questions, including questions about age, sex, race, et cetera. Next up, we have the American Community Survey. This was started in 2005 to replace the census long form questionnaire. This is where we get a lot more socioeconomic data, which helps to inform how a lot of federal funding is distributed. The ACS is only sent to a sample of addresses in the United States, unlike the census. The ACS differs from the census in that it is not an official count. So where the census would try and count every person in this room, the ACS would just count a few of you. Then, using that information from the smaller survey pool, the American Community Survey is calculated to make estimates about the rest of the population. These estimates are also known as period estimates. This means that the ACS does not represent a single year, rather the characteristics over an entire data collection period. So who's left out of this data? According to a report released by the Census Bureau in March 2022, Latinos had a net undercount rate of 4.99%. This is three times the undercount rate of 2010. Black people were undercounted at a rate of 3.3%, which is numerically higher, but not statistically different from 2010 rates. People who identified as white and not Latino were overcounted at a rate of 1.64%, and Asians were also overcounted at a rate of 2.62%. Not to mention the fact that the census has historically undercounted populations that are harder to reach through surveys, phone calls, and door-to-door -door canvassing. These include Native Americans on reservations, poor urban communities, and undocumented immigrants. 
While undocumented immigrants are encouraged to fill out the census, many do not because of fear of legal ramifications. Additionally, the ACS reached an unusually low number of people in 2020. And the reason this is so important is that parts of the population that are undercounted lose political power and representation since congressional representation is based on these counts. This is also an issue since the census is used to help determine where federal funding goes for schools, hospitals, roads, Medicaid, and other programs. When we are looking at the racial data from the census, there is one last thing to note. The federal government recognizes Hispanic, Latino, and Spanish origin as an ethnicity, not a race. As you can see on the sample census questionnaire, people both have to answer their race and their ethnicity. And this can be pretty problematic for a lot of different kind of groups of people um, where this underrepresentation can kind of um, bleed into redistricting some of those congressional representations um, with kind of the way that it gets filled out. I was just talking to a student the other day about the same kind of issue um, where the student's Latinx and they said they didn't feel comfortable because um, they did not identify as white, um, so they always just kind of put other and put a uh, Hispanic um, as the other option there. So it's not really an inclusive necessarily kind of survey to it where everybody can see themselves represented in the census in the way that it is. Now, as we kind of said before, um, I'm brand new to Richmond, so I don't know how many other folks here are brand new to Richmond, but I need a reference map in order to understand where everything is. So what we're looking at up here is the Quad County area, um, which very many of you are probably familiar with, where we have kind of the very rural county up at the top there in Hanover, then Henrico, which is a very suburban kind of county around the city of Richmond that's kind of right there in the center, and then Chesterfield, another kind of suburban area to the south of it. So as we start to look through the rest of these maps, like kind of uh, have the context in your mind as you kind of look through them all. So now into the data. When we look at the results of the 2020 census, we can see that Richmond is still racially segregated. White individuals concentrated in the West End, Asians, again, concentrated in the West End, and the black population concentrated in the East End of Richmond. Here, I've added in a map of race and ethnicity, but I want everyone to be aware that this map double counts people because those who identify as Hispanic or Latino also have to choose a race on the census. Zooming in, we can see how strong the legacy of redlining remains in Richmond. The practice of redlining began in the 1930s when government maps outlined the areas where black residents lived and therefore deemed them risky investments. So when we overlay a map of federal redlining with today's data, we can clearly see this. Today, these neighborhoods in the East End experience more heat, more poverty, and higher eviction rates than anywhere else in the city. So while the West End eviction rate is around 3%, some neighborhoods have eviction rates around three times the citywide rate of 11%. And the home ownership piece is so important, um, as we all kind of know. Um, if, you're not, if you don't have the access to the capital or to the loans, then you don't have necessarily the same type of ownership in your neighborhoods or communities as somebody who might actually kind of have that. So by excluding people from the ability to get the loans and whatnot, they excluded their ability to have home ownership and then actually owning a part of their community and having the skin in the game that's necessary um, to really create and build strong communities. So next we're gonna talk about some of these socioeconomic inequities that Kyle just mentioned, like home ownership rates. To start off, here's a map of median household income, or MHI for short. The census tracts in dark green represent areas with and MHI greater than 150,000. These areas in light green are areas with MHI less than 50,000. So in the West End, we are seeing areas with higher incomes and in the East End, areas with lower incomes. When we look at median home value, we see pretty much the same trends that we saw on the last slide. Looking at median gross rent, there is some missing data, but not much is changing when we, in where we are seeing higher and lower values. Switching over to home ownership rates, we can see a pretty stark contrast between the city of Richmond and surrounding areas. So once you cross over into uh, Richmond city boundaries, the home ownership rate really starts to decline. Going over poverty rates in the Quad County area, we can observe that the highest rates are pretty much contained to city boundaries. 
When we focus that data in to look at child poverty, it seems to be worse both in the city and in surrounding census tracts. When we look at a map of immigration after 2010, we can begin to ask questions about why we see clusters of immigration to particular areas of Richmond. So when we go through these, we can see that most of the time, the West End is better off in terms of these socioeconomic indicators, from educational attainment, to employment rate, to vehicle ownership. So we just showed you a lot of maps of census tracts, but let's, uh, let's kind of zoom back in a little bit and kind of think about it a little bit more of what we're kind of looking at. So we're gonna do a tale of two census tracts, which are um, right at about Bon Air, maybe a little bit to the southeast of them. But we have two different census tracts here that are, have two very different socioeconomic positions associated with them and def different demographics also attached to it. So census tract 06, the one kind of to the north there, um, has about 3,900 people in the track, which matches about the overall Richmond City average. Well, in that track, it's only about 14% non-white population, which is far below, about 30% less than the overall Richmond census track average if we were to kind of look at it in those terms. Well, we look at the actual socioeconomic indicators in it, there's a 92% home ownership rate, with, which is about 30% um, higher than the overall Richmond average and we have a higher median household income and a higher median home value than kind of the overall Richmond average. Directly adjacent to it is track 07 down there, which has a very different both demographic makeup as well as socioeconomic um, indicators makeup as well, where it has a few less people in the track, but that track is overwhelmingly about 77.5% non-white population. But the home ownership rates, you can see the extreme difference between the two tracks there, where there's about an 80% difference between 06 and 07, which are just right next door to each other. Median, home, median household income is below the citywide average, as well as just a fraction of the overall average in the track that's directly adjacent to it. And median home value is about $120,000 less in that track that's directly adjacent to the other one. So when we started this project, one of the things that we were trying to kind of figure out was what Sarah really wanted to deep dive and unpack in the census. There's so many different ways that census data is used and a lot of different ways that people have used the census. And Sarah really cared about focusing on trying to quantify and show the inequalities and the inequities that are happening around the Quad County area, which fit pretty well with um, what one of my mentors at Michigan State University, Dr. Joe Darden, um, who spent the past 50 plus years fighting for urban fighting against urban inequities um, and kind of working really deeply with census data. So in 2000, Dr. Dard and Dr. Kamel, they created an index that was based entirely around ACS census data that could show socioeconomic position. So it wasn't just looking at a map of one variable, but you could make a map that would show off a number of different variables through the combinations of them. And so with this Darden Kamel index that came about, there was nine different socioeconomic variables that could be combined together to show off a broader picture of the inequalities in Richmond than just a singular map would be able to kind of show. So you have the usual suspects in this index of median household income, median home value, poverty, employment rate, but then they also have some of the ones that are very specific to the ACS data, like percentage of vehicle ownership, percentage of managerial occupations, where you do some little transformations, a little bit of math into these scores that creates an index of it, and where higher values are gonna represent higher socioeconomic position and lower values and negative values are gonna represent lower socioeconomic position. What's so impactful about this index is that we can visualize it, just as we did when we were looking at these variables individually. When we do, we get this map with dark purple census tracts representing those with very high socioeconomic position and red representing those with very low socioeconomic position. So if we want a holistic understanding of a given census tract, this is a wonderful tool. For more of an idea of the spaces we are looking at, let's zoom in. Census tract 502 in dark purple here is just west of the Willow Lawn Shopping Center, bounded by Pedersen and West Broad. On the bottom, we have census tracts 201, 202, and 204, which include the neighborhoods of Eastview, Fairfield, and Brower, just to name a few. These census tracts are just north of the rapidly gentrifying Churchill neighborhood and northwest of the VCU Medical Center. What's even more impactful about the index is that it doesn't include race. But when we put a map of non-white population in Richmond next to it, the message is pretty 
pretty clear. People of color are the ones experiencing lower levels of socioeconomic prosperity. But as geographers, we know that maps can sometimes lead to misleading conclusions. This is pretty much the premise of a wonderful book called All Maps Are Lies. So we put this map, we put this data into a different visual so the message is more clear. Here we have two scatter plots to help us understand the correlation between race and socioeconomic position, or SEP for short. Each dot here represents a different census tract. The y-axis represents the percentage of the population in that census tract that is black. The x-axis shows us where that census tract falls on the index, with negative numbers showing census tracts with a low SEP and high numbers showing census tracts with a high SEP. So here we can see a census tract with a high black population falls lower on the index. On the other hand, census tracts with high percentages of white population fall higher on the SEP. The graphs both show a very strong inverse relationship between race and socioeconomic standing. Probably one of the most compelling visualizations that came out of this project is this temporal comparison. To the left, we have a graph showing estimates from 2005 to 2009. The graph to the right shows us estimates from 2016 to 2020. A look at these graphs shows us that the inequities based around race and socioeconomic position have not gotten better over time. They have stayed the same if they have not gotten worse. So while median household income has been slightly above average compared to the rest of the United States for the last several decades, this prosperity clearly isn't experienced equally. And looking at the maps we have seen here today, it's clear who's being left out. Now, after seeing all this data, I found myself reflecting on my experience here and the importance of this project. I found myself asking, why is it so important that everyone comes here today and sees this data? And then Alexandra Byram uh, sent me this quote from John Meeser. John said, knowledge can make a difference. You need to first know if you're completely oblivious to something, if it's out of your realm of thinking. You can't fix something that you're not aware of. And reading this quote put it all together for me. What John Meeser did by creating this project was create an accessible form of data to empower us to make change. I know that I have felt incredibly empowered by this project and have found myself reflecting on what I can do to work at reducing the inequities seen on these maps. That's why putting data like this out there is so important, so that, so that we can fuel conversations like this and give passionate individuals evidence for the change they are trying to make. On that note, I want to say a sincere thank you to you all for all coming out here tonight. Thank you to Dr. Kyle Radikin for being such a wonderful mentor on this project. Thank you to Alexandra Byram for her kindness and steadfast report, support. <laughs> thank you to Tom Shields and Jonathan Zur for making this project what it is today. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to participate in this research, unpacking census data, and I'm excited to, con to continue this work for the rest of the year. So we will be here after the presentation to chat or if you have questions, but I think now we're gonna move over to the panel. Well, I'm Tom Shields and um, Associate Dean in the School of Professional and Continuing Studies and that's a pretty hard act to follow right there. Uh, I want to first uh, congratulate and say thank you to Kyle for your leadership on this and the work that you've done in a short amount of time here at the university. You've already had a pretty big impact. But in particular, Sarah, that was just incredible. Um, Sarah's parents are here today. They drove down uh, from near Winchester. If you two can stand and we can recognize you for amazing uh, daughter that you have. <laughs> okay. Alexander, so it's good. You told me to advance the slide. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the panel here, and maybe if you all can come up, I'll introduce you when you're up here. Uh, but um, in doing the question and answer, and really the questions, well, I have a few that I'll ask of them, um, but it really will be you all to help generate these wonderful questions, and then they'll provide the answers. 
I'd also like to take a moment uh, of pleasure, if you won't mind, and, and privilege in to introduce my dean, Jamel Wilson. She's the dean of the School of Professional and Continuing Studies. Jamel just waved, but thank you. We all wear various hats in SPCS, and Jamel, thank you so much for the opportunity for me to work on this project with great colleagues. So, um, so uh, we have a really wonderful panel here today, and um, I'm very excited about this and the opportunity for them to dialogue with us all and in dialogue with you. Um, and so be, if I will, uh, I want to start off with some introductions. On the far end of the table uh, is Albert Walker, who is the Program and Strategy Officer at Richmond Memorial Health Foundation. Thank you for being here, Albert. Hello. Next to Albert is uh, Genevieve Siegelholly, who is the Associate Professor of Education and Leadership at VCU. So Jen, thank you for making the way down here to our spiders. Uh, and then next to Jen is Javon Burton, who's the Executive Director of the Partnership for Housing Affordability. So Javon, thank you for being here. And lastly is Kendra Norell, who is the Senior Program Officer at the Institute for Sustainable, Sustainable Communities. So thank you, Kendra, for being here. So um, again, I said, like I said, I just have a, a couple questions to get us going, and I hope you have come prepared to ask questions of the panel. Uh, after they answer my questions, we'll have mics here uh, roaming, and you can please make sure you have the chance to, to ask your questions. So the first question I have for the panel, and I'm just going to go down the line, starting with Kendra, if you don't mind. Um, how has the census informed your work in our region? Kendra? Yeah, so um, previously I worked for the city of Richmond in the Office of Sustainability, and we have the Climate Equity Index map. And so we used that process to really identify, well, we kind of already knew a lot of the maps in Richmond say the same thing over and over again, no matter what data you're looking at. But we were used those to really talk about and share where the cross sections were for inequities in the city and how those compared to uh, climate impacts, climate resilience, climate adaptation, and climate inequities in the city of Richmond. And having the visualization of the census data, having the visualization of all of the science that would go back for what future impacts there were, what current impacts there are when it comes to climate, really spoke a lot more to um, a lot of the residents than us just saying that there were these risks that were uh, in these different communities, especially since climate, I don't know what everyone feels about climate, but climate's not everyone's top priority. It's always been my top priority. And so being able to have those visualizations really was able to connect to things like transportation, housing, education, and health. Um, and so that really helped us further along our climate action planning process and get more engagement because we were able to have that visualization and those maps that showed inequities across the board. Thank you, Ken. Javon, on housing? Um, yeah, absolutely. So in um, my space, we focus on affordable housing. And a big part of our organization's work is collecting data and then sharing it with local governments so we can better understand the housing challenges in our region. Uh, but most importantly, how we can use those data to advocate for policies that we need in order to increase opportunity. And so we collect on uh, census data on about every three years or so. Um, we're actually just completing that process right now and using the 2020 census. And a lot of our work is focused on how can we work with local governments to become better consumers of data. Um, census data is not everyone's forte, so we don't need everyone to be an expert, but how can you be a sound consumer of those data and interpret it? Uh, in a correct way. So I think the other thing is there's a lot of competing priorities and issues at the local level. It's difficult to advocate for things like housing against other issues if you don't have the data to back it up, if you don't have the information to say, well, rental housing is a big need in our community despite um, what some residents may say. We have the data to show that a lot of residents are in need. We need a lot of units. Um, also, home ownership is an issue as well and there's disparities within different housing groups. So we collect things like um, housing units by group or by age, by size, household size, looking at living arrangements, how many adult children, uh, adult children are still living with their parents to understand what's happening in our community. So a lot of this is imperative work in order to advance housing policies and opportunities throughout the region. Thank you, John. Jen, with education? Sure, so I'll, I'll speak broadly about education, because I think that's part of my role here, and then <laughs> about how it also influences my own work. Um, so the census matters for education, in part because I think the, the presentation referenced this, 
um, federal funding is distributed to schools partly on the basis of census counts. And that the federal funding is around special education, Head Start, after school programming, um, classroom technology uh, needs, free and reduced price lunch. Um, and then sort of more indirectly, it is, as the presentation noted, used to apportion political power. And that political power matters for schools um, because it's the way we think about whether or not we're going to get an infrastructure bill that's going to fund school construction and modernization through, or whether or not student civil rights are going to be protected if we have an executive branch that is not committed to that. Um, so it matters, in short, for schools, since the census matters for schools. And I think in my work and in the work that I've done with Tom, um, Brian Koziol, John Neeser, has been thinking about the relationship between educational opportunity and housing segregation. And too often the two sectors, schools and housing, are kept siloed, the data is siloed, um, as one, one manifestation of that, and they are so related. And so trying to think about the way the neighborhoods underneath something like school attendance boundaries um, shape what goes on in the school enrollment. The census is really critical for that. And it also tells us the enrollment in public and private schools. And as the push to privatize public education increases on the conservative side, we really need to better understand those private school characteristics. So I'll stop there. All right, thanks. And Albert, with uh, health? Yeah, so health is where I am now and health philanthropy. But I mean, to be quite honest, the census you know, has influenced my work throughout my many lives in Richmond. Um, so I would just <laughs> want to take a point of privilege just to say thank you, Sharon, um, for sharing John with us. Um, you know, um, it, early in my career uh, at a nonprofit in the East End of Richmond, I did not know much about this work. Um, and so, and Jonathan, thank you all for bringing me into the conversation 10 years ago um, to just learn about the census to learn about poverty traps, to learn about racial segregation. Like if you grow up in Richmond, you've been in Richmond, you know that that's a real thing here. Um, school segregation, but then, you know, it, it, don't let John's smile and his nice way get you confused. Uh, he knew how to cause good trouble um, by democratizing data. Um, and so he took information about the census and then translated for everyday ordinary people who could use that information um, to, to, to advocate for themselves in ways that uh, we're still seeing the results of. And so how does it inform my work? You know, it, it, you know this kind of work and, and, and that kind of engagement just helps me to relate and to, to work with people differently. My whole engagement strategy about how to you know, work with everyday ordinary people and give them good quality information about how to advocate for uh, the different things that they need in their community. It's nothing more powerful than being able to, um, you know, bring knowledge, right? And, and there's nothing wrong, it's nothing wrong with power. Power is like fire, you know? It's, you know, it's how you use power, right? Like, um, and so, um, and so, sir, I appreciate the work that you, you've done the things that you've highlighted and you're continuing in that legacy of just naming, not just facts, but it, it causes all of us to begin to wrestle with truth. Um, and so in health, you know, I found myself now in health, you know, it helps us to be able to say, why is it or how is it that, you know, people, children born in the East End tend to experience a 20 year life difference than some other children in Richmond? Like, what is it about, um, and it's census data, census data around life expectancy that helps us to understand those things. Also in health, it helps us to understand that, you know, um, when we are advocating in front of policymakers about some things to do, you know, we can say um, definitively that, you know, your zip code is just as much a predictor or a determinant of your health as your genetic code. And so with that, allows us to do is to be able to intersect with education, housing, and climate in a way that traditional health has, has, 
and still needs um, to do um, as we move forward. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Albert. So um, in thinking about this, uh, and I, if you're seeing here kind of the connections, one of the things that I think is so valuable about unpacking the census is the connections that formed, not just in terms of looking at the census data in the Richmond region, but the connections to these issues of climate, of housing, of education, and of health, transportation, other areas. And so I love that, Albert, this notion of intersection, um, and particularly your phrase, democratizing the data. The data is so important to this, um, and the relationships, the comparative analyses that you see here. So um, I wanted to next ask you, in terms of what was presented this evening, what is one thing that you can take away, and even to address the audience? And one of the things that John always did, and I followed in his lead, and Jonathan did, and others, Thad, and others, when you'd present this data, is that you'd, is you'd hop around the maps. <laughs> the maps were, you know, they, don't, they do lie, but there's so much valuable information there, Sarah, you know? So if you want me to hop around the maps, I'm happy to go do that, okay? If there's something that was pointed out here, I'd like to go back to just, but what's one thing that you noted here? Kendra, we'll start back with you, that, that in terms of the issues that you presented to here, those relationships that you wanna talk about tonight. Yeah, so I kind of mentioned this last time. Uh, I don't work uh, in the city at all anymore, and it was great to see the 2020 data because I've not seen it yet. Um, but uh, what overall that came out of this, and like the maps are very similar to what they were before. And so it's just kind of being in this space of we know, we have, the, we have the maps, we know the data, and we're still moving in a space where we're sort of working in that direction to really address what is being shared in that way. Uh, but also that I, this is the first census I was able to participate in. And so I filled out a census form and I knew that where I was filling out the census form, I would not be in that location by the time that the uh, day would be released to the public. And so it was just kind of interesting to be in that space of knowing that things are probably gonna stay the same, but honestly, what is the accuracy of what we're getting by the time that we're sharing it with the public? And so I thought that that being in the moment was very interesting for me. I don't know where I was um, when I was 20, but I didn't fill out. <laughs> um, and so just being able to take that and like have that personal experience also integrated into what I'm seeing when I talk about the, this data, these maps, and just like knowing that we're speaking from a place of everyone has not filled out any of the, the census information, but also people who have filled out the census information may no longer be in that space as well. Great, thank you. Yvonne, yeah, one um, thing that you noted here this evening, and if you want me to hop around, I will, but yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I do think there was one slide about um, the undercounting, and, yep. and that's something that has come up in the housing space in particular. Uh, obviously, the most recent census uh, was unique in the fact that we were in a pandemic. And um, some of the data that we've gotten back so far, we've had to take with a grain of salt. And I think that's important because, you know, the idea of maps do lie and, you know, how do we interpret these data? We looked at the fact that we saw a significant increase in the number of homeowners in the most recent census data and a drastic drop in the number of renters. And that didn't really square with what we know about the housing market right now in the region. We know that we have far more renter households um, than what the data initially bared out. So we looked at what was the reason for that and the response rates uh, for the ACS were a decrease of 10% from the last time that we collected the data. And I think that that's very imperative because when you look at what the response rates looked like for people that are households that were lower income uh, and less educated, uh, the response rates were far lower. And those are the households that are more likely to rent yeah. than to own a home. And so that helps us understand well, why do we see this divergent trend of an increase in homeowners and a big drop off in the number of rental households. And I think the, the idea around funding is also critical for some communities because in the housing space, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, they provide federal entitlement funding to local governments across the country. Uh, to meet that threshold, to, to be an entitlement community, you have to have a certain number of citizens in your jurisdiction. If you don't have 200,000 citizens, you won't qualify uh, for community development block, block grants, which is very flexible funding for things like home repairs or down payment assistance. So if there was significant undercounting, um, and now all of a sudden you're well under 200,000 uh, residents when in 2010 you were more, 
Well, that's a lot of funding that you as a community won't have access to, and that means a lot of residents who won't be able to get down payment assistance or home repairs that they need or any other critical um, services that probably can't be made up for in your local government budget. So um, the idea <coughs> of undercounting and, and who it impacts the most is something to really think about. Great thoughts, yeah. Jen, things that you've noted. I think we're all stuck on the same slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I would add, we were in the middle of a pandemic, and we were also in the middle of a concerted chilling campaign. You know, the Trump administration had floated this idea of a citizenship question on the census, which would have overturned two centuries of precedent. Um, and at the 11th hour, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. Um, but the word was out, and so undocumented residents who may not have been as fearful in the past were even more fearful in, in terms of understanding everything that went into that undercount. Um, I also, you know, as the education perspective, I noted that, that there, I may have missed it, but I didn't see anything about schools, and so it would encourage, you know, another iteration or it sounds like you got a whole year on this, so I'm happy to talk with you about how we might think about education in there because it is, it's such an important um, part of opportunity and educational attainment uh, feeds into to jobs, median household income, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing I note from a policy perspective is since, since John started us down this path 10 years ago or more, um, there have been, and people in this room have been working on these issues, uh, partly spurred by the maps, by unpacking the census 2010, people up here. Um, and so if there are any points of progress to highlight, in the, I'm looking at Ben Campbell, in the transportation arena, for example, um, I'm thinking of one of John's maps with the, you know, can you get to this place? Here are the jobs, here's where the yeah. public transit lines go. Um, and there's a disconnect. So points of progress to help people understand that it is possible to change these maps, um, and if so, how we might, might do it. That's a great thought. That's a great thought. I can share with you that map, or Ben and I can. That was one of the early iterations mm -hmm. where you had this great transportation map and the hubs and where you could go to, and it turned out you couldn't go to too many places in Richmond. So more to come on that, Sarah. Thanks, Jen. Albert? Yeah, I think we're all on the same same slide, you know, how those most impacted uh, by structural inequality, you know, is, is, is grossly underrepresented in the, in the data. Um, but I think, you know, for those of us who are, you know, uh, in school now, who will be some day leading um, some organization, and for those of us who are on a systems level, it causes us to kind of think, like, how we thinking about our roles in this system um, and how we are really trying to think about how we are looking at inequality and using data, working with everyday ordinary people to try to, to, try to, to reimagine something different. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always struck that, you know, that the whole um, redlining, the homeowners loan corporation policy how that's over 80 some years ago, and to this day, we're still seeing the effects of that policy. And just, and just how inequality, structural inequality, um, just adapts. Um, but we are like human beings, thinking, full-bodied, brilliant human beings, and how we have to learn how to adapt and really rethink um, the way that we interact um, with these systems and in our institutions. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm encouraged, I'm hopeful um, that we will continue the conversations and, and lean in a little bit more about how we might be able to start thinking about these systems and how we, we should be leaning in. Thanks. <clears throat> and um, almost time for your, for your questions. I, I want to note, I'm not on the panel, but I do have a couple favorites here. Uh, I thought the redlining one, Sarah, and there's some folks from the DSL here, uh, the Digital Scholarship Lab that did that was just wonderful. If you get a chance to take a look at that, you can see kind of how the racial makeup of those areas is changing dram dramatically due to gentrification in some of those, and you can look at that. So that was a great a new addition. And Kyle, I love the ability to look at the comparison and socioeconomic, the SEP uh, data that your mentor in Michigan State provided. That's a wonderful, great comparison to it and a great addition 
Uh, every year this uh, has changed and improved. And as some of the panelists know, we'll circle back to some of those other factors. Um, so great uh, additions to those, along with the explanation of the undercount in this particular census. So, um, well now it's your time to ask some questions of the panelists and want to make sure that you have this opportunity to do that. Uh, we're going to have some mics that are going to be roving around. So what are the questions that you've come to, either about the census itself, the collection of the data, as you can see here, and, the, and the, some of the practices that it were involved in the 20 census data, or the ACS, or just of the issues that we can, and if you want to address it to a specific panelist, or we can ask the panelists all them to look at it uh, holistically. So please. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation and for the panelist um, answers. Um, I'm going to try to get to a question at some point. Um, so, you know, I think this is all really fascinating and think there are so many stories that can be drawn out from these maps. Um, and I think one story that I'm interested in is the linked fates between the development of cities and the social problems that are concentrated there and those of the wealthier surrounding suburbs. Um, and the way that I often feel frustrated that cities alone, um, you know, cities didn't create their problems alone, and yet local governments work in a way that you can't necessarily make demands as a Richmond resident of Henrico or Chesterfield to share some of the responsibility for the historical and political processes that led to wealth concentration outside of the cities and wealth dispossession inside of cities. And I'm curious, I think this is the question. <laughs> I'm curious across your issue areas, the way that you feel constrained by um, local politics. And if you, have, if, you, if you crave, in the way that I crave, more regional collaboration and solutions to things like affordable housing, um, uh, like transportation, uh, job distribution, you know, the spatial mismatch between where residents can afford to live and where the jobs that pay a living wage are, and whether we need to reimagine metropolitan governance in a way that equitably or fairly um, like redistributes power on beyond just like city limits. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, I'll, let, I'll let any of you tackle that. I, I, I'm going to let Javon We, we did not plant that question. That's an amazing question. Uh, but thank you for that first question. Um, so which one of you would like to tackle that? I know all of you have a thought. Uh, and who's raring to go? Because this is a hot one. So, yeah, it is a yeah. hot one. I'll take it. All right, Javon. Yeah. And then please chime in. <laughs> yeah. Fight for it. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's a wonderful description of <laughs> the challenges that we see, and in fact, that's exactly what's happened in the housing space in the last three or four years. Um, and it uh, actually was spawned by data, uh, eviction data in particular. And you know, Richmond has the second highest eviction rate in the country, and so what does that mean for us as a region? And evictions are just one symptom of a larger, larger issue, which in this case is affordable housing. So we came together and worked with local governments to figure out how they can recognize, one, that Housing is a regional issue. Um, you know, issues don't just stay within one jurisdiction. They know no boundaries. Uh, if someone is displaced from the city of Richmond, they're likely to go to somewhere that's surrounding counties. Um, I think the other piece is the counties are beginning to recognize that poverty is beginning to suburbanize, particularly in Henrico and in Chesterfield. You're seeing poverty rates um, increasing over the last 10 to 15 years, and also different populations um, that are living in those jurisdictions. And so that's having a great impact on what housing needs look like. Um, it's not just single family housing on large lots anymore. People want things like multifamily housing or mixed use development and having a, an urban setting um, and what has typically been suburban setting. So we actually work together with our local governments as a region to acknowledge that and work on policy together. So how can we advance things like more rental housing through zoning changes um, as a region and working together to figure out since each jurisdiction is different, yes, but there's also a lot of similarities that they have. Um, they all can increase the amount of zoning that is allowed for multifamily development. That is not just a, a city issue or just a, a county issue, that's a, a region-wide issue. A stat that I like to share all the time is that 
our region um, only allows, all the land area in our region only allows for, 3% of it allows for multifamily development. Um, that's something that would need to drastically change in order to meet the, the needs that we have currently, but also our future needs. Um, we look at the census to show us what our projections are by income, and so we know that we're gonna add 29,000 new low-income households over the next 20 years. Those households will need somewhere affordable to live, and it can't all just be in one jurisdiction. So they have a recognition of that, and I think it's just a matter of, do they show a sense of urgency around the issue? Um, we've seen more regional efforts in recent years, and maybe some of you can speak to that. Transportation, there's a new regional transportation authority. We don't have something like that for housing, unfortunately. Um, but we are able to work together, and the local governments in particular, on housing since there's so few local tools that we have to make a big impact. I think that they've come together in the last few years to really recognize we need to work together. Um, homelessness is another yeah. thing that our localities work together as a region on. And that's mainly because HUD dictates it. Um, HUD says if you don't collaborate, you're not going to get federal funding, uh, which sometimes is nice to have that um, kind of larger entity over, overhead to say you have to work together in order uh, for us to, to provide investments in this, in this issue. So. Um, hope that's at least starting. For yeah, questions. yeah. Others I know. Um, Kendra? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's no regional collaboration for climate. Um, the city of Richmond is the only municipality in the area that has an office dedicated to climate or sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so they're not to say that the other municipalities don't incorporate that in other ways. Um, I'm not 100% certain, but there's not a direct place to have that level of collaboration on a governmental level. And so that was one of the issues when talking about the climate action plan for the city of Richmond. Any of the any information that we had, we know that climate doesn't stop at city lines. And so it's just very interesting to take all this information, make these plans and see that, you know, we would have a lack of transportation per se for like the GRTC public transportation. We could not advocate for that at the time to have people use that to go to uh, their jobs outside of the city of Richmond or to have bike lanes that would take you outside of the city of Richmond. So there was like a lot of hard stops on what you could do for climate action planning because there wasn't that level of cooperation in that space. Um, and there, it was very difficult to take every individual department with the surrounding municipalities and really incorporate that into how to make more of a regional plan involving climate action specifically, uh, especially for uh, adaptation and mitigation efforts. And so just looking at the information that we had, we saw that flooding was going to increase significantly, significantly on the south side, but that wasn't going to stop once you hit Chesterfield. Yeah. Um, it was going to continue into Chesterfield, but none of the work that we were doing would be able to speak to any of that. And so it's definitely something that you know, they're starting, the region's starting to work on it in a lot of ways, but historically, Richmond, Henrico, and Chesterfield have a poor working relationship, and really identifying ways to move past that is something that we're seeing now, but just not in all areas of planning or development. Yeah, fascinating. Um, health and education. Uh, I'm sure you two have a lot of thoughts about that. No? Oh, I'm sure, Albert. Um, Jen, I know you have some thoughts on education. I do, I do have some thoughts. <laughs> uh, um, I would say yes. The, <laughs> the metropolitan area is a missing unit of governance, and that is to the detriment of everybody in the met metropolitan area. Um, in cases where I have seen more regional cooperation, it has been incentivized by higher levels of government, either the state or the federal government. Um, and and we, we have seen some progress on this in, in education in Richmond over the past decade. And I'd also say that all of these areas, except for climate, that we're talking about, I mean, there are pre-existing structures for regional cooperation. In, in education, the state's divided into, Jamel's gonna correct me, eight regions, eight superintendent's regions. Um, and, and region one you know, includes just about every district in the Richmond metropolitan area. And they come toge together regularly and meet about all kinds of things. Um, and out of some of those, so those meetings, those regular meetings, grew an idea for a new regional magnet school focused on providing equity and access to um, uh, coding, right? 
I know a ton about coding. And <laughs> Just kidding. Not, nothing computer at science. all about coding. But, uh, uh, called Code RVA, and they have a weighted lottery to ensure that the student population roughly reflects the region. It is based, um, the entrance to the school is based on interest, the student's interest in computer science rather than um, the school's interest in selecting the kid who has had computer science training since you know he, was, he or she was three years old. So there are some examples, but there is much more work to be done. There are also processes in place for, for districts to come together and form a single district to collapse into one merge metropolitan area. It would just take the consent of all the various governing boards um, that wanted to do that. But it is possible. I'm just saying it is possible. Um, and we do need to think about it. Yeah. And, and other regions have done it, as yeah, per your research. And other research. regions have done it. Uh, Albert, in health? Um, yeah, so that's a big jargon. You know, <laughs> earlier this year, I was in uh, Rachel, is it Sadur, Sadur class? She's a, a, a law professor here. Um, Sudan, I, I, I get it wrong, but anyway. She had a course on, um, you know, uh, about healthcare and um, like it's health. One of the big questions of the class was, is healthcare a right or a privilege? And so then that gets us to begin to start thinking about like health and then in many ways the business of health and how we commodify health. And so when we think about commodifying anything, uh, you know, there are some people who can benefit from it and some people who won't. Um, we're fortunate in this region that, um, you know, a lot of us got together around Medicaid expansion and so the state got around it and we were able to we were able to do some things um, in and around um, providing coverage for some of the most vulnerable folks um, in uh, our state. But there are a lot of people who fall beyond that threshold who still need health care. Um, and then there are people who are not, let me just say, our neighbors. There are neighbors in our community who don't fit um, our, our, our I would just say immigration standards or our, you know, you know these are Latinx brothers and sisters um, who don't fit uh, into some of our programs. Um, and so, but these are live human beings, you know, who um, have dreams and aspirations. And then what are we doing or thinking about in terms of health? Um, and so, you know, I think what we really need to start doing is being leaning into some of the thorny conversations. And so, you know, Richmond is a polite town. Um, we're very, I heard someone say, we're an evolutionary town, not a revolutionary town. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of revolutionaries here uh, in this town. Um, um, but I think, you know, there are institutional muscle memories that we all have to um, begin to work uh, in our respective places to kind of move the needle. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a good one, a good one to lead off. Um, what's the next one is maybe whoever wants to go next, we can get a microphone to you. One of the things that was part of a previous Unpacking the Census, and John was so excited about this, was the work of Jim Ryan's book, Five Miles Away to a World Apart. And he actually did a mapping where he did a, uh, much like the Bonaire census tracks, Kyle, where he did a, a, he drew lines and did the same to that question's point. So who else has a question for the panel? Yeah. Uh, there's two on this side. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Doug Pick, and um, here as here personally, but I'm also the CEO of Feedmore. Um, and so, to my friend here, um, we're in Richmond, uh, but we have 275 agencies across 29 counties and five cities. So, so nonprofits can can cooperate and can cross boundaries, and I think that's part of the solution. But we're working with Albert and his wonderful team, and some of the other folks. Um, thank you for this wonderful data. We use data a lot to try to understand where food insecurity is. And it maps directly uh, to everything you've seen. Albert mentioned what is really, we, we would call the social determinants of health, uh, where so many th these things, there's a confluence uh, of all these facts. Um, I, I will tell you, I, I was in business for 35 years before I came here, and I, people go, what, what's the difference between for-profit and non-profit? You know, is it the talent, or what is it? And, and my comment is always, I never knew how steep the hill was for these folks. I never knew how steep the hill was. I can't tell you how discouraged I am 
to see those charts where in 10 years you haven't seen much improvement. Um, I get discouraged by a lot of things. I'm not sure I'm going to be very optimistic here. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's the systemic issues are yeah. so huge. So I'm, I'm curious if we should ever try to say, what programs are we putting against this? Or 10 years from now, we would just say, oh, the data is still so-so. You know, how do we, how, in business, if you had a, you had some issues like this, you'd put together a team, you'd, you'd put some projects together, and you'd at least measure against what you were doing. So I'm curious um, from anyone who's in the business of tracking data uh, and all of this, is, does anyone ever try to track the efforts against it to see, and then maybe they, even that's just too huge of a, of a task, because yeah. whether it's health, education, housing, or food, maybe it's too big. Uh, but somehow, how do we get away from looking at data every 10 years and go, ah, oh, it's too bad? Because uh, I know we do a lot of good, but we, we, don't, we don't solve people's issues. Right. Food, is a, food is a huge help to them, but my goodness, there's five other things they're dealing with that day. Yeah. And so does, does anyone ever take this uh, and, and, and try to put the programs we put against it and measure ourselves yeah. against it? Do the localities do it? Do, I don't know. We do, we do it as a food bank. We try to see how many people are, who don't need us anymore. Yeah. That's our holy grail. We don't want more customers, more clients. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. So um, Doug's question here is, and some of you have already mentioned some progress in the use of the data and what you've seen. Javon, you mentioned it with some of the things in terms of housing, but other climate's so new, Kendra, right, in terms of a topic issue, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but other opportunities here where the data, using the data, showing progress, seeing, I think another one would be obviously code RVA, Jen, but um, where we might be utilizing the data and showing some progress, you know, is in terms of, I think if that's your essence of a little bit of your question. Any thoughts on that here with your specific issue? Yeah, I can um, just say really quickly that we try to do that quite a bit because housing is such a seemingly insurmountable issue. Um, if you're going to go and present before a local government board, a supervisor, city council, I think the last thing you want to do is make the issue seem like they can't put a dent into it because then it's you know, a level of apathy that can generate and, well, well why bother trying, trying to fix it or show a level, a level of urgency? So I think we try to show things like, you know, let's, things may look bad on the ground level, but let's take a higher level view and how do we compare to other regions or how do we compare to other cities and, and these issues? So if you look at homelessness, for example, our homelessness per capita uh, is far lower yeah. in just about every peer region that you have to Richmond. It's about 4.9. Um, per capita. And that means that in reality it's solvable. Um, you know, people usually don't think of things like homelessness as a solvable issue, but it is. You can have enough shelter beds to meet the need of individuals who are unhoused and have homelessness be a rare, brief um, intervention that you can solve and then move them to housing stability. Um, but the reality is you solve that through having housing. You can't have folks just stay in shelter because that means more people are going to be on the street. Um, and outside. So we try to show them information like that, um, the data coll we're collecting right now. We're looking at what's happened since the last time we produced a report. Um, and we can see that there's been 2,700 units of affordable housing built since 2020, but we also need to compare it with, well, how many more people are in need of that housing? And Richmond is growing as a region, and the pandemic has shifted that. We have more people moving from other metropolitan areas because Richmond's had this perception of being uh, at least less expensive place to live than other places like DC. But we're slowly losing that competitive advantage, so it it's helps us demonstrate a sense of urgency, um, but it is important, as you said, to show progress is being made, and if we keep doing some of these efforts, you know, we can continue to, to make that progress. Right. Others thought on that question, or? Well, this might, this might come across as somewhat pessimistic, but I, I think I, I'll, I'll try to circle back to the optimism at the end. You know, these maps show that they make visceral structural discrimination. That is their power. Yeah. And they help people understand the relationships between all these sectors that we pretend are unrelated, and many people would like to think that they are not beset by discrimination. But they are. The maps make it hard to turn away from that. But I think as a country, as a society, we struggle to reckon honestly with these patterns and the way that you know a century of decisions, policy, individual, um, legal decisions have structured the inequality that we see in the maps. We're not going to get 
around to solving it unless we confront that reality, the ongoing reality of racial inequality in our cities. So this is step one. And we have, we've made some dents, I think, over the last yeah. 15 years. They are not systemic but they are moving the needle and they wouldn't have been possible without first recognizing the fundamental reality of structural inequality. Albert, did you have a follow-up? Um, and Genevieve, thank you for saying patterns because you made yeah. me think of a thought around systems, right? So, you know, the, the problems that we talk about inequality, um, and you look across the board, whatever the, the sector it is, it could be housing, health, whatever, you know, one of the things about it, you know, there's a, there's a person who talks about these problems as being wicked in the sense that it takes, you know, a lot of different people involved to change their minds about a very complex problem. I think the challenge that what we're good at and what we, we have done well, um, you know, we're at a foundation, uh, health and racial equity is what we're really all about. And what I've come to learn and what I'm learning at the, at the moment is that we're very good. And it's the beautiful thing about like this data and the way you disaggregated the data by race. We're very good at disaggregating uh, indi individuals of particulars and seeing how that impacts on one. But in some ways our conversations always get siloed, right? And we never go from analysis to synthesis. And I think the work for us is to be in relationship in a way that we can yeah. begin to start putting back together. I mean, like we're good at deconstructing. We can do it and analyze it, but now how you put Humpty Dumpty back together again? It's, it's, the, <laughs> it's the job or not. Um, and I think putting Humpty Dumpty back is going to require for some of us to be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and when are we going to be okay with being a little bit uncomfortable? Um, and so that's, that's the juggernaut. Um, uh, you know, you know I, I, I mean, when you, when you just look at the, the suffering of people, you know, that, that has to be a piece of you that just says, hold on, man, this, we, got, we got to do something different, you know? And so, um, I, I, you know, keep raising the awareness, but also we got to move to action and, 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 and then pull on each other to make each other uncomfortable a little bit. Um, and Doug, you, you know how to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who try to make you uncomfortable. Um, Can, but we got, but yeah. it's in love, right? Like it's not, it's not about, you know, it's, it's about a, a loving uncomfortability, you know, um, where, where we honor the dignity of people. Yeah. Right. Okay. Getting back to just humanness. Yeah. Kent, do you have a thought on that, Kendra? Yeah. Uh, brief? um, briefly, kind of what Albert said about uncomfortability for climate, if you really break it down to its many individual pieces, you, one example is sidewalks have increased, the amount of sidewalks on the south side have increased. We were able to map out and see that there was a lack of pedestrian infrastructure in areas that had higher black populations in the city of Richmond. And so there's been an intentional effort to increase the amount of sidewalks in the city. It's very slow. Sidewalks are far more expensive than anyone thinks they are. Mm -hmm. um, and in that process, there's been a lot of complaints from neighborhoods that already have sidewalks that are like, well, why aren't my sidewalks getting repaired? Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely like to meet or to acknowledge the inequities that exist in the city and to address them means that a lot of neighborhoods that historically have received constant um, maintenance over the years are going to receive less maintenance while we're trying to get to the point where inequities are not in existence anymore in the city. Um, and so I think that part of with climate action and climate um, adaptation specifically is that there's a lot of infrastructure improvements that need to happen that are slowly happening across the city, much to uh, the disappointment for other residents who are already in places that have that infrastructure already built in, but it's not being maintained at the level it was before. Yeah, I have a sidewalk that needs to be repaired. So, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, Tom, to some extent, those are false choices. Yeah. You know, yeah. like we could, <laughs> we could choose to pay more no. taxes so we could. Right, right. Yeah. Well, a lot of these are false yeah, choices. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll just answer my own question real quick through the house and, and the homelessness. Kelly Kinghorn at, at Homeward, uh, that's a great example of collective impact. 
uh, framework that John Kenya started many years ago. Yep. I keep trying to sell around this town where you, you put the clients at the center and you surround them with nonprofits and for profits and government, and you have a 10 and 20 year outlook, not a two year outlook, but you, so you can make a generational difference. And everyone has to contribute to that. So I just ask people to look up Collective Impact. It, yeah. FSG was the firm that started it. It, it at least was a framework we could all grab right. hold of and be, hold ourselves accountable to. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Doug. Um, we are, we're almost out of time, so I want to make sure I stick to the time limit here. Alexandra, right? Uh, but there's one more, okay, yep. Uh, well, because we haven't gotten this side, so let's be fair on this side over here. There's yeah. Equity on this side. Yeah, equity, <laughs> equity on that side. We need a patterns over there, uh, yes. Hi, um, first I just want to say thank you to everyone who organized this event and members of the Unpacking the Census Project. I just found this event on Eventbrite, so I'm just really happy to be included tonight. Um, my question is more about responding to the individual and calling to action the individual. So um, I have lived and worked in the East End community for several years now, and through um, getting to know my neighbors, I, I hear their, their re stories, their realities, and their realities absolutely match up with the data that we've seen tonight on those maps. And um, through my own experience of seeing the systemic inequities play out and how they manifest in particularly in the East End, I would also say they absolutely match the data. However, I know many people in my life who struggle to connect to this data, the truth of the data, because it doesn't match their own personal experiences. Um, so I'm just wondering from your, the perspective of your different sectors, how would you respond to individuals who are struggling to connect or struggling to conceptualize what this data actually means beyond the map um, or what your hope would be for them. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great almost concluding question um, for the panel if you can address it in terms of these are, these are real people in this data, right? And they all have individual narratives and stories. And how do we make sense of that in terms of those narratives and stories? And maybe some examples in terms of where you've seen the data become real um, John was always, and Jonathan, one of the first initiatives they did was to bring in real people in dialogue with it and not just have the data. Um, thoughts on that? How do you make the data real and, and express those stories? Albert, do you want to start with you and then we'll come down this way in the panel? Um, so I think with, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, uh, John, Jonathan, uh, but places like um, Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities, Richmond Hill, Initiatives of the Change, they, these were spaces, these were containers where um, folks from different racial, economic, social backgrounds were able to get in, a, in, in conversation with one another. I think, um, you know, you live in, in, you live in the East End, right? Um, you, know, um, you know, getting comfortable with just talking about race and talking about like, um, like normalizing that conversation. Um, and I think there's a lot of personal work that one has to do with themselves because it's heavy. Um, you know, I moved to Petersburg and I just had a conversation about asking me, what, are you considering yourself a gentrifier? I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. let me think about that. <laughs> you know, um, and so there's, there's things that we all have to wrestle with. And I think um, the beautiful thing about being in community it's just that, being in community is when we uh, can just find out how to relate to one another. So I would encourage folks to one, try to be in community, find safe spaces where you can be in dialogue with folks who can talk about the thorny issue in Churchill. I mean, like that's a real, like where are all the black people going? I mean, can we just say that out loud? Like, <laughs> I mean, like Richmond has lost yep. a significant black population and where they're going, they're now all moving to Hanover. No. Unless somebody knows something in Hanover, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, being able to name what we're seeing and feel it, as, as Courtney Rice, um, my colleague here, she also, just sit in it. And like, when are we gonna just sit in it and just feel it? And then like, sitting in it and feeling it will cause us to do something differently, I hope. So, 
Beautiful answer. Yeah. Next, others thoughts on this? Yeah. Give that some round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I, I, this is one of the times I get to say, this is why school segregation matters so yep. much. Um, if public schools reach nine out of ten of our children, and they remain segregated, then our worlds remain segregated. Our ability to understand different worlds is tremendously truncated. And that has such serious implications for a multiracial democracy. I mean, the, the stakes grow higher every day that we don't at least try to get our youngest citizens together to learn how to care about one another and share with one another. That is one of the most pressing policy issues of this time. Thanks, Jen. Remains. <laughs> it's been a pressing issue. <laughs> yep. Javon with housing. Um, well, I'll say for housing, one of the challenges we have, we use data a lot to dispel myths. Uh, we're often doing a lot of myth busting when it comes to housing because there's a lot of misperceptions around what housing and particularly affordability and what affordable housing means and uh, who that means will be living near you or could be living near you. Uh, that stokes a lot of fear, it's a lot of uncertainty, and um, data has a limit, I think, is what we've found through that process. Um, there's a lot of folks who have beliefs that are bone deep, and there's no data point that can persuade them um, one way or the other. So I think we run up into that quite a bit in housing, and it's frustrating, and there's some folks in the room that could tell you very, um, from a business standpoint, how that's impacted them and, and the impact in our community as a result of that, and not being able to get housing developments built because um, you know, a certain segment believes that it's gonna bring crime or many other challenges to their community. Um, we can show them all the data to say that that's not actually the case, but at the end of the day, we need the individual with the lived experience that you talked about, right? There are tons of folks who are impacted by a lack of housing or lack of affordable housing and accessibility to that housing. Um, but many of those are not the individuals that are at public meetings or at town halls who are saying, you know, that this is needed in our community. It's often the folks that are saying quite the opposite, uh, that we don't want this, individuals that it's not really gonna impact. And so um, that creates a, a difficult situation, I think, for some of our elected officials where you have constituents who are saying this is something we don't want and you don't hear very much from constituents who actually would benefit from it. Um, and so it creates this false reality where it's where there's only individuals who don't want this and say that this would be a detriment to our community and not a benefit. Um, and that's, that's not the case. We have the data to back it up, but it's important to, to supplement that data and pair it with lived experience and the folks who would be impacted by it. So um, bridging that gap is something that's incredibly difficult, but we use data as much as we can to re-educate elected officials because it's a lot of issues and maybe when there's an election coming up, you forget that, oh, affordable housing is something that I, I do care about. So it's important for us to continue to, to educate and, and use the data that we talk about in this space um, to ensure that we know that this is not just a certain segment of your community, it's everyone in your, in your jurisdiction that needs this and benefits from it. Thank you. Kendra, last. Um, fortunately for climate, uh, it does not discriminate against anyone. And mm. so, unfortunately, infrastructure does discriminate against people. And so, one of the things that is that Richmond is going through is that with the gentrification of a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of people are moving into places that don't have the infrastructure for uh, our climate trends. And so, heavy rainfall will cause flooding across the board. The East End is a really good example of this. There's a lot of flooding in the East End and that flooding is in all areas of the East End um, because the infrastructure was not created for the amount of rainfall that we're getting or will continue to get. Um, looking at tree plantings across the city, there's been an increase in amount of the amount of people volunteering for tree plantings because the city is so hot and there are so many neighborhoods that historically have not had high tree canopy that are now, that now have residents who are aware of this. And there's like a sense that we know what we need to do. We see the heat maps for the city of Richmond. We understand that tree canopy is what will offer some cooling, sense of cooling for these different communities. And so there's been more of an effort to have that level of tree planting in the city. And so because climate is not really location, like home based or like location neighborhood based specifically, 
it's really, I think, created that sense of community um, where people recognize that even if you are really more in the, a self-interest kind of way, that if you increase the infrastructure uh, for climate in one area, that will positively benefit your area as well. And I think that that sense of you know, identifying where people need that, need that connection to create that sense of community is important across the board and something that climate has going for it because there's just a broader sense of who gets impacted by it. Right, yeah. Well, can we give this panel a round of applause for the... <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thoughts. Thank you so much for your time here. Um, I now like to invite up Amy Howard, who's our Senior Administrative Officer for Equity and Community, just to give some final thoughts here. Amy? Um, thank you all so much. This is an amazing panel. The research is fantastic. I'm so proud of it. Um, I don't. I wish I could put a bow on this complicated conversation. Um, I do want to say this. Uh, in honor of John Meiser and Sharon, we're so glad you're here. He taught those of us who had a chance to work with him in the Bonner Center day in and day out the importance of the human family and that my fate is linked to all of your fates and everyone in the East End's fate and everyone in the West End's fate. And I'm sitting in front of a room of people who work in all the sectors that we have in this region and this project, which demonstrates what happens when we bring people from higher education and nonprofits and others together to work and learn and think deeply. Um, so I think that John would remind us that all of these issues, as we know, are connected and they're hard and they're frustrating and it's unbelievable that the maps haven't changed more but so much progress, it's slow, y'all. So slow, so much progress actually has been made in chipping away at these structures. And if we can keep our humanity and the connection that we have to have for one another in place and bring collective impact and each other to the table for real alignment, we can continue to do some real good and we must. So the urgency is upon us and I'm really grateful that you all are here tonight and bringing your wisdom and that you're continuing this work. There are people in this room who've been at this work for 50 or 60 years, you know who you are. And there are folks who are joining us in this work right now as college students, and it's gonna take us all continuing to do it together. I wanna end by thanking Alexandra Byram, who refuses to actually be publicly thanked enough. She has been the glue of this project for a decade. Um, <laughs> Thanks again for coming. I look forward to continuing the conversation and the work together in community to make a more just community, and I hope you'll join us outside for a reception. Thank you. <laughs>